rejoice in the Lord. The theme for today is joy, for he is near. In anticipation of the joy in the Lord, we light the third candle on the Advent tree, recalling that joy is one of the surest signs of God's presence among us. At times we are fearful of the Lord, but the prophet Isaiah tells us, Be strong, fear not. Here is your God. He comes with vindication. With divine recompense, he comes to save you. As we light three candles on the Advent tree, may we recognize the strength of the Lord that saves and be ever ready to welcome him into our lives. Hymn number 76.
because we are sorely hindered by our sins, let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Christ according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Amen. The former Henry Nowen, a Roman Catholic priest, author, and theologian, wrote in one of his books, All action ends in passion, because the response to our action is out of our hands. And that is the mystery of work, the mystery of love, the mystery of community. They always involve waiting. And that is the mystery of Jesus' love. God is revealed in Jesus as the one who waits for our response. And it is precisely in that waiting the intensity of God's love is revealed to us. I mean, if God forced us to love, we would not really be lovers. The end is that God reveres our freedom and respects our dignity and waits for our response. Advent you know, proclaims the coming of God in Christ but it is a coming to set the creation free from the bonds of sin and death, not to overpower it for the sake of controlling it. It is a great gift given to us, God in human form and Jesus to show us the mystery of God's freedom and love. How will we respond to this great gift Will God come among us and find us unheedful, acting as if our salvation lies at the mall or in the frantic pace of holiday fever? Or will God come among us and discover us actively waiting, open and present to the mystery of all mysteries? Will God find us paying attention to Jesus the one to whom John the Baptist points and who implores us to embrace? Or will we be paying attention to hundreds of lesser lights that can mask and dim the reality of the coming light? Just when you know, we should be looking forward to the manger, Advent has us once again looking inward 
taking our own spiritual temperature. And it is in this time of waiting and looking inward that we discover who we are. In the Gospel reading today, we hear John from the Gospel, his version of what John the Baptist came to do and say about waiting. Now people were wanting to know who he was. He shows up and he starts baptizing the people. So he's asked by the authorities, who are you? And this question, though unspoken, is, asked, is one asked of us by those around us all the time. I mean, through their perception of our behavior, through their, you know, through their interaction with us, their understanding of our stance, on the broader issues. So when the authorities pressed John to say something about himself, you know, he doesn't even choose his own words. He paraphrases the prophet Isaiah. I am the voice, the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. So who are you, John? John is that voice that came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. And as we read, John, the gospel writer, wanted us to know that John the Baptist was not the light nor the word, and his sole purpose was to bear witness to the one whom he is not. And until the one came whom he is not, John's life was one long advent, awaiting in the dark for the light, awaiting without knowing for the one who would change everything. See, John sees his mission as baptizing and pointing to the one who was coming. For the role of a prophet is always to announce the truth, the word of God. And it is to show the way of life and liberation in the face of all the powers of evil. John came to call the people from the powers of evil to a conversion of the heart and I can just imagine how difficult it must have been for John. Here, you know, he doesn't even know who he's waiting for, but he's waiting for that one who is greater than he. And he can feel pretty helpless sometimes to wait for something that is not here yet or for someone who is coming. We know that's, that's this time of year. Yet, in spite of not knowing, his waiting involved action. See, our waiting in this time is not nothing. It is something. Because we have a tendency to be shaped by whatever it is we are waiting for. See, when, when we want something very badly, we have a tendency to rearrange our whole life around that goal. You know, it might be a new house or a new baby, or the hope of moving up in a company. I mean, for me, I spent over a decade waiting and preparing myself to, to leave my home to a place quite a distance away to a seminary and an unknown future. But waiting, you know, is an essential part of our faith. Because the mystery of our faith is that we're always waiting. We're always waiting for Christ to come to us. Even though we believe he has already come as the babe in the manger, as the man, the savior. And that he's coming to us right now in word and in sacrament. And what John the Baptist is saying to us is that this time of waiting 
should be shaping our lives. It is to be an active waiting that seeks to have a closer relationship with God, through Christ. A waiting whose sole goal is to witness to the light and keep pointing to Jesus. And Paul emphasized this pointing in the reading today from 1 Thessalonians, which is one of the earliest Christian writings of Paul that we have. When this letter was written, the one whom the Baptist is waiting for has come. No, no longer unnamed, the Lord for Paul is Jesus Christ, and the tradition out of which he speaks, which he writes, is one that includes the experience of Jesus, the light of the world. Yet, the Thessalonians are concerned with the fact that Christ has not returned as soon as they expected. So Paul speaks to how they were to continue to hold out for hope, hold out hope for something they wanted very badly, something they had rearranged their whole lives for, but was now so long delayed. As, as we, as we are in this same waiting, the church of First Thessalonians went about developing their faith in God during this time of waiting. And Paul encourages them to exhibit agape, the Greek word for love in the scriptures. And Paul would describe the meaning of agape in much more detail in his letter to the Corinthians as a love that is not characterized by the emotion of the moment, but is more nearly an act of will. When we want, we set out to love. And for that reason, the conduct of, of the new church has always been critical. It was critical for the new church, it's critical today as a witness. And his use of agape is of a love that models the self-giving of God in Jesus Christ that respects our dignity and waits for our response. So the first Thessalonians, they are a model. The Thessalonian church of how we can live in this time of tension as we acknowledge God's future plan for this world at the same time recognize that it is broken and that it fails to honor the ways of agape. Your Advent challenges us to seek to know the voice and movement of the Spirit not only in our lives but for our world. We are to ask and seek to know what is quenching the spirit when issues of poverty, care for the destitute, and the lost are at stake. And this was the way of John the Baptist. His way was of preparing the people for the Messiah by seeking to turn the hearts of the people so that the curse might be lifted from the land. And this was the prayerful wish of all the prophets, that God would pour out the Spirit upon them all. And John, you know, cries out the truth, the truth that points straight to Jesus, where the Spirit of God is revealed. And so therefore, in the powerful words of Paul, we can rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. 
keep your soul and your spirit and body sound and blameless until the coming of the Lord. Henry reminded us that God doesn't force us to love, but waits for it. And John the Baptist, along with Paul, reminds us that we are to be a voice crying out in the wilderness, preparing a way for our Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come as a light for the world, a world that asks, who are you? May our lives reflect the light of Christ, and may we live in such a way that we proclaim and point to the light of Christ for the world.
We prayed for the sick, especially the Lords and the Barners. Sue Rose Harder, Nick Healy, Dave Keenan, Edith Ann Power, Donald Williams, Jane Orsick, B.D. Way, Marion Ralph Somerville, Ann Millay, Kim Sel Somerville, Pat Crampton, Kristen, and Eric White. Send the Spirit of Jesus upon us, O God, that we may be your songs of peace and joy in this world. We pray in the name of the one who is our peace and joy, Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, and mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand in peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
all our kids uh, and all, any adult who would like to be a part of it, you may also. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, give you some props as we go into it next Sunday. And then afterwards, we'll have Christmas lunch together. Then on Wednesday evening, it's Christmas Eve. Uh, I know. So we'll have two services here. Uh, we have a service at 4.30, and we have a service, then at 10 we'll have carols, singing of carols, and at 10.30 we'll have a service, the second Eucharist of the night. Um, so I hope readers and Eucharistic ministers, I think I've got the 10.30 set up, but I do not have the 4.30 set up. So if you're coming and would like to read or help at the altar, <laughs> um, I'm going to need help at the earlier service. And acolytes, I'm going to need acolytes too. <laughs> okay. The Christmas poinsettias, um, I didn't get, have an opportunity to put a, a form in your bulletins, but if, if you'd like to sign up for, to make a donation for the poinsettias, um, it's always helpful, and just fill out this form, and then we'll have an insert in the, in the Christmas bulletins. Christmas tree, or giving tree, excuse me, the giving tree gifts are to be brought back next Sunday, wrapped with the ornament on them so we'll know who they belong to. The cookie walk this past Thursday night um, was, I think we did just about as well as we did last year. Um, we, when all things were said and done, we made around $400. And, um, but we have cookies left over, and so we'll have some cookies for our party, and then we'll also have cookies and, you know, off and on for the next probably month <laughs> at coffee hour. But um, thank you so much to everyone who made cookies and helped and, um, you know, everything you did was such a, an important part of making that a successful evening. And we've already got the money all given away, I think, <laughs> which is good. Do we have any birthdays? Birthdays? And next week, Dimitri is going to play for our offertory. He's going to be playing the piano, one of the pieces that he's um, been working on. Of course, this devotion comes from the Society of St. Andrew, 
So they're reminding you to place a coin in your coin box for every blessing you name. Remember, we're going to collect those coin boxes on January 4th, on Epiphany Sunday. The Sunday will recognize the Epiphany um, to bless and to give thanks for um, the help that, that money will bring to, to those that are hungry. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks for all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Hymn number 66.
to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with John the Baptist and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
Number 58. 